go to Luke chapter number five, please. Luke chapter number five. We're going to go right back to where we were this morning. I'm going to preach a short message this evening. We're going to move right along with some other things tonight. So take your Bibles, go to Luke chapter number five. You there? Have your Bibles with you. I hope you have your Bibles with you. And uh, good to see you in the Lord's house. All right? Luke chapter number five. We'll begin reading in verse number two. Go to verse number one. And it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But when the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets, he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering, he said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when, he, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the other side of the ship, that they should come and help them. And they come to help them and filled both ships so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all. And followed him. Lord, I pray that you'd help me for just a little while this evening. Lord, I pray that you'd help my voice to be strong, to be clear. And Lord, not allow the devil to get the victory in this moment. May you help us and encourage us. Lord, I pray that you would use the word of God to do the work that you desire to use it to do. I pray, God, that you'd help your people tonight to, for just a little while, focus on the truth and, Lord, the actions of our life. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, every one of us ought to have a filter in our life, a spiritual filter in our life. We don't have that today. We, we live in a world that is trying to remove every ounce of righteousness and holiness amen. And, and anything that's honoring to God. And Satan is very subtle. He knows exactly how to do it. And we allow things to enter into our life, enter into our minds, enter into our homes, our churches that honestly don't pass the spiritual litmus test, I guess, if you will. It hasn't been filtered through the Word of God, through the things of God. We allow ourselves to get involved and to have attitudes and certain positions about things. And we never give consideration to what God says is right. Every Christian should have a spiritual filter in their life, and that filter is the Word of God. If God's Word said it, we believe it. If we can go to God's Word and find it, it's so. And so we need to be very careful. I believe that God commands us. I know in God's Word He commands us that we're to be, a set, up, we're to be set apart. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And many of us take that and we... Our goal is, is to be as unlike the world as we can. And I understand that side of it. But that's not the separation God wants. God wants separation from the world to Him. And we're to be like Christ. We're to be separated to Christ. And we're to be like the Lord. We're to honor the Lord. And, and we, are to, we are to think that way. We are to behave that way. We are to talk that way. We are to uh, allow our lives to be influenced by things that that are honoring to the Lord Jesus. We reap a harvest where we place an emphasis. If you place an emphasis in your home on spiritual matters, then you'll develop spiritual thinking. Amen. Let me say that to you again. Some of you need to wake up and catch this. I'm fishing in a pond right now and you need to bite. Amen. If we reap a harvest where we place an emphasis, if we emphasize the spiritual matters in our home, then we'll... we'll develop a spiritual pattern of thinking. Amen. 
And if we do not, then we can only expect the opposite of that, which is carnal. They're only, you're either spiritual or carnal. And when we try to operate in the things of God and carry out the plan of God, but there's no spiritual filter, there's no spiritual thinking, there's no spiritual uh, emphasis, then we're trying to carry out spiritual matters with a carnal mind. And it doesn't work. We wonder why there's such a struggle between God's will and our will. There's a struggle between uh, what God wants for our homes or what God wants for our children. Why there's a struggle in the lives of our kids. It's because we've never developed in them a spiritual emphasis. What does God think about this? There's going to come a day, mom and dad, when we're not here. And if you haven't built that into the minds and hearts of your children, they aren't going to care what God thinks. Right. When the Sunday school teacher says, sit down, we're going to learn about the Bible. I don't care. This is stupid. There's a problem. And you say, well, that's just, a, that's just a little thing. No, it's not. That's the devil pulling at a heart. It's God pulling this direction and Satan pulling this direction. And it's your job, mom and dad, to fix it. Develop a spiritual emphasis in your home and you'll develop spiritual thinking. In other words, if we don't emphasize this book, if this is not emphasized in our home, then your kids, when they get up to come to church on Sunday morning, aren't gonna, it isn't going to matter to them if they got it with them or not. I don't even know where this came from. I'm just going to plow this row, though. We get, we get so consumed with everything else that God gets put on the back burner. We can get so full of ourselves, as if God needs us. God said, if you won't cry out, the rocks will. If you won't, if he, <laughs> Balaam, if you won't listen to me, I'll use your donkey. Let's not get too big for our britches to believe that God can't survive without us. Place an emphasis on spiritual matters. Place an emphasis on spiritual thinking. Place an emphasis on what God says is right. And you'll pass that down to the generation to come. We better do that. We teach them everything in the world. Every daddy wants their son to be like them. Every son, to a point in their life, wants to be just like their dad. Every daughter mimics their mom. And if we don't take the opportunity to teach those that come behind us the importance of God in our life, He'll never be important in their life. That has absolutely nothing to do with the message. We're back in Luke chapter number 5. I think it's worth saying though. Luke chapter number 5. We left off here this morning. And I gave you four things. Did I give you four things? I gave you one of the invitations. I'm going to preach that one tonight. But I gave you four about launching out into the deep. The Lord, the Lord if we are going to launch out into the deep, it stands to reason to launch out there has to be a loosening. We have to untie ourselves from the docks. The, we have to untangle ourselves from things that are keeping us from where God wants us, all right? There has to be a loosening. There's a learning. What do we learn? We learn that there is no success in life until Christ is on board our boat. When did they catch fish? They caught fish when Christ was on board. God always prepares his people for what he desires of us. He said, launch out in verse number, in verse number three, he says, thrust out a little from the land. And then the next verse, he says, launch out into the deep. God always prepares us and God's will is always perfect. God's will is always perfect. Then we learned also that there's a living. There's a living. True joy comes when we are obedient to God's will. And God sometimes has to break us before he can bless us. The Bible says they begin to, they begin to pull their nets up and the very things that they were cleaning in, 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 chap, in the beginning of the chapter were breaking and falling apart. Their boat was sinking, but God blessed them. And peace comes when Jesus is near. And then we find ourselves here in verse number 10. Or verse number, uh, let's look at verse number 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. 
we know the story. I went through it this morning. How many of you were in the service this morning? Raise your hand if you were. How many of you were not in the service this morning? Well, we find ourselves here in an interesting passage of Scripture, which was really not unusual. Jesus always works in the realm of the miraculous and the supernatural. And the Bible says that the crowd here pressed upon him, and he desired to teach him. And while the crowd began to witness something that was miraculous, God's work was very personal in one man's life. And I want you to understand that this evening, every time that you open this book, whether it's in church or your walk with the Lord, your devotion time, your prayer time, every time you open this book, God is wanting to work in your life personally. God is, He knows where you are, He knows what you're dealing with, and He wants to deal in your heart and life very personal. And the Bible says there's a man here by the name of Peter, and he takes Peter's boat, and you know the story. And Peter launches out into the deep, and he says, Master, we've told all night and caught nothing, and he says, nevertheless, at thy word, some of us need to make up our mind. We're going to live our life based upon what God's word says is right. The end, that's how it's going to be. And if we'll do that, God will bless us and the Lord will help us. But he says, nevertheless, at thy word, in the next verse he says, and when they had done, and when they had this, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and God blesses. Listen, there is no blessing apart from God. Every good gift, every good gift, every good gift is from above. There is no blessing apart from God. Every good thing in your life is because of the Lord. Every good thing in our life is because of the Lord. And the Bible says that God blessed and they begin to bring the fish in. The nets begin to break. The boat began to sink. And the Bible says they learned about life and living because peace comes when only Jesus is near. But the story doesn't end there. God not only works personally, but God always works for a purpose. God always works for a purpose. You've heard me say that God does not lead us to leave us. In other words, God does not work in our life and lead us through what we go through and allow us to deal with what we deal with and allow us to learn what we learn to drop us off and say there. No, God leads us to lead us. God's leading will cease when the trumpet sounds. We get to glory and the battle's over and we'll worship Him. God does not lead us to leave us. God leads us to lead us. And God is working in, in, in Peter's life here personally, but He's working for a purpose. And He says here, we see this in verse number 8, and when Peter saw it, when Peter saw it, we live by faith. We live by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk by faith and not by sight. But Peter, in this passage of Scripture, was able to see what God was doing. He was able to see how God was going to work. God doesn't always allow us to see how he's going to work. But I promise you, God is always at work. God may not allow us to see how he's going to work, but God is always at work. And the Bible says here that when Peter saw it, something happened in his life. When Peter understood what God was doing, there was a dramatic change in his life. How many of you remember the day you got saved? Did you raise your hand if you got saved? You remember the day you got saved? What a difference the Lord Jesus Christ makes. Immediately, friend, there's a difference. God changes us. When Peter saw this, I believe there's that moment of salvation when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I believe there's a moment not only of salvation, but there's a moment of surrender. Sometimes those happen at the same time. Sometimes they don't and we get saved and we live our life and we, we tr still try to do it our way and, until we finally realize, wait a minute, God's got a better way. Right. And we surrender our life to him. I believe this was the moment of Peter's surrender. I believe this was the moment that Peter said, wait a minute, I get the whole picture now. I get that my life is more than just fishing. My life is more than just getting up and going to school and coming home. My life is more than just getting up and going to work and spending life and trying to make it balance out and do all this. My life, there's got to be more to it than that. Peter understood it. And here's what happens. The Bible says in verse number 
9, he says, uh, verse number 8, when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, be very careful. Peter was not telling the Lord to get out of his business. That's not what Peter was saying. Peter didn't get mad because God stepped on his toes. Hey, pay attention. Peter didn't get mad because God broke his nets and about sank his boat. That's not why Peter was telling the Lord to leave. You know why Peter was telling the Lord to part from me? Because when Peter began to measure his life next to what God desired, he seen how, how desperately short he fell of what God wanted. And he was immediately humbled. God, why would you even ask to get in my boat? God, would you, why would you even speak to my heart? God, why would you even want to work in my life? Oh, sinful man that I am. The Bible says that Peter falls down at Jesus' knees for he was astonished, verse number 9, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. Skip down with me in verse number 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I said this morning, if you're going to launch out of the deep, not only is there a loosening and not only is there a learning and not only is there a living, he said there has to be a leaving. There's a difference in a loosening and a leaving. When you take that boat out, Brother Ray, you'll pull those ropes off and you'll throw them on the inside of that boat and you'll be gone for a little bit. But you leave the ropes there because you're coming back, guess what, to tie up again. The Bible says here they cut the ropes off. It says that they forsook all and followed him. Everything Peter had known in his life, you talk about calling to, to the mission field. You know where God calls missionaries from? He calls them out of the local church. You know where God calls missionary families from? He calls them out of places where they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, where they're serving God. By the way, don't tell me you're called to be a missionary and you can't be to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're going to have a hard time being a missionary. Oh, don't tell me you're called to ministry. You don't ever show up to minister at Bethel Baptist Church. Don't tell me that because that contradicts God's word. Peter, listen to me. The Bible says Peter was just comfortable doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was a fisherman being where he was supposed to be. And God said, Peter, I got something different for you. And that moment of surrender when Peter realized what God wanted for his life was so much more important than catching fish. He forsook all and followed him. Some of you need to leave some things behind. I believe, that I, have a, I, believe I serve a God that has the power to change lives. I believe in a moment God can open your eyes and your life can be completely different if you'll surrender to His will. If you'll just say, God, my life, there has, listen, I don't have to convince you of that. There are people living in this world today and their thought process is this. There has to be more to it than this. There has to be something else. They've tried and spent and accomplished and done and lived and been and gone and they're still miserable and their thought is, what is it that's going to bring true joy? There's got to be more than this. And Peter says, when he recognizes what God wants for his life, it instantly changes. Fishing no longer is a priority. Did you hear me? Peter had done it all his life. And immediately God said, that's not important. I've got something better for you. I'll share a little bit of a personal testimony. I'm going to move right along here this evening, but I love to play basketball. If you, were, if you were in this church when I was a kid growing up, that's all I ever did. Played basketball, ate, drank, slept, basketball. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I remember there were times in my life when I know I probably broke my mom and dad's heart when I would sometimes miss Sunday school to be at basketball practice at Armstrong. There was a lot of times that I, I know that I probably made basketball I know in my life I made basketball a God it's all I ever wanted to do I was going to be the great white hope I love to play basketball I went to Armstrong and made the team there and didn't play much but I made the team and was probably running faster than I'd ever run jumped higher than I ever jumped enjoying the activity but there was something missing. 
And somewhere during that basketball season, the Lord got a hold of my heart. And I said, God, if this is not what you want me to do, I won't do it. And I left and went to Bible college. The basketball team at the Bible college that I went to wasn't near as good as the basketball team that I'd left. But something began to happen in my heart. God began to change the things that I desired. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Stop for just a moment. Is the Bible true? Amen. Would you say amen? amen? We can still say amen here. I know it's Sunday night after spring break, and you're tired and worn out, and our allergies are going like crazy, but we can still say amen. amen. My wife said, honey, I, I, took, I took more Sudafed than I was supposed to take this morning. She said, I was, I, I was amen in everything you said in church today. I know it's on Sunday night, and everybody's a little tired, and uh, some of us smell like smoked chicken, which ain't bad, amen. I told the prayer meeting this morning, I said, listen, if I get a little hungry, I just bite under them fingernails, you know, there's a little bit more left there, you know, just a little taste, amen. Ah, don't you worry, some, everybody, look at everybody looking under the nail, I mean, I got some of that there, man, whoo, man, that smells good. God, listen, pay attention now, the Bible says, is, is the word of God true? Yes, he says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So if we're not desiring what God wants, the flip side of the equation is this. We haven't been delighting in the Lord. If we're not desiring what God wants, then we haven't been delighting in the Lord. Because God said, if we delight in the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. My heart began to change. And you know what? Basketball became unimportant to me. I pull my videos out every once in a while. I probably have done it twice since I've had children. And those were, somebody asked my wife just recently, what's the box that you put in that machine under the TV? <laughs> Looks like a big bo box of Mike and Ike's, you know? I said, that's what we used to record on. They're called VHS tapes, all right? I'll put them in there every once in a while. My kids will go, who's that skinny guy running down the floor? That's your dad, son. God began to take away what I thought was important and it began to transition and transform into what God said was important. Why? Because when we begin to delight in the Lord, He doesn't give us what we want. Some people say, well, I'm going to serve God so He'll put my family back together. I'm going to serve God so He'll fix my kids. I'm going to serve God or I'm going to get right with God so that God helps my finances. That's not why we serve God. If we delight in the Lord, God doesn't give us what we want. He changes what we want. And the Bible says here that Peter experienced that moment of surrender when he said, when he saw what God wanted for his life was so much more important than what he desired. And here's the, here's the outcome. He forsook all. He said, boat, nets. You don't think those nets were valuable? What was he doing at the beginning? He was cleaning them. Because they were necessary to his livelihood. And here's what he did. God, I'll leave it all to follow you. Amen. He forsook it all. He left it. Because he understood that there is nothing more important in your life than the opportunity you have to honor God with it. Amen. Nothing. Where's that kind of Christianity at? Where you, we talk about biblical Christianity. We don't understand biblical Christianity. When's the last time we were willing to walk away from anything for God? When's the last time we were willing to sacrifice anything for God? When's the last time your children saw you sacrifice anything for God? I can't give up that night, and I can't give up that night. I got this that night, and I got this that night. And the only time we have for God is is what we can squeeze in. Peter said, I left it and followed him. There's a leaving if you're going to launch out into the deep. You know what Peter said? From this moment on, God, there are no ropes tied to the dock. There are no boats to support me. There are no, there's no livelihood to take care of me. He said, God, it's completely in your hands. You say, well, I remember when Peter, yeah, you know what? We're all flesh. We all fail. And by the way, 
The Bible says when he denied the Lord, what did he do? He went out and wept bitterly. If you're going to leave and launch out into the deep, three things I'm going to give you. Number one, it takes a decision. It takes a decision. Where did Peter make his decision? Peter's decision was made in verse number eight. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. There's a decision to recognize who God is. We have tried to, in the culture in which we live, make God everybody's buddy. We've tried to make God one of these buddies that we hang out with or we, we, we chill with or whatever other word people use today. And God's just one of the guys. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God that changes lives. The God of the Bible is a God that died for my sin. The God of the Bible is a God that saved my eternal soul and demands my life. Amen. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Involves a decision. The next thing that it requires if you're going to leave it all and follow the Lord is not only a decision, but it requires devotion. Look what the Bible says in verse number 11, if you would, please. And when they had brought their ships to the land, what is the first thing they did? They forsook all. Can I tell you, I promise you, Peter loved his boat. How many have a boat? I heard of one pastor who had a boat and he, he bought a boat. He named his boat Visitation. And every time he left to get out on his boat, he would tell his secretary, if anybody calls, tell them I'm on Visitation. It's like going to visit the Green family for us golfers, amen? Tell them I'm on Visitation. Every boat you ever see, most boats you see, you go down to the Savannah River and you walk along River Street there and you'll see those nice big boats out there sometime and every one of them have a name on the back. I think it's interesting how they try to come up with those names. I think they, they spin around on a bat for about 10, 12 times and whatever word comes out of their mouth, that's what they call it, amen? They'll have a name on it. Why? Because that boat means something. It was, it, it was important to them. It requires sacrifice. It requires time. It requires effort. It requires labor. They love it. By the way, you only invest in things that you love. You only invest in things in your love, that you love. I'm sure Peter loved his boat. I, I'm sure Peter loved his profession. Have you ever heard fishermen stand around and talk about fishing? They don't ever stand around and talk about, man, I tell you what, man, I, I, can't, I can't stand fishing. No, they, talk, they stand around and talk about the big fish they call and the good time. And everybody's one up in somebody else because they heard about this story. Same way golfers do when we play golf. I got to throw that in there, you know. I played golf the other day with my brother. I beat him. Matter of fact, I beat him twice this year. I, didn't, I forgot to tell everybody that second time, you know. We only played about 14 times and he's won every other time, but I beat him twice this year. We talk about those kind of things. Why? We love them. I'm sure Peter loved his boat, but Peter learned to love God more than he loved his boat. Peter learned that God was more important than his plan. God was more important than his idea. God was more important than his purpose in life. Remember, God always works personally, but God always works purposefully. He, he made the, the decision to be devoted to God. He forsook all. The Bible says there, look at the words specifically, if you would, please. How many again believe the Bible's true? Amen. He does. The Bible says, look at verse number 11, and he forsook, what did he forsake? All. He didn't keep anything in his back pocket. He didn't, he didn't use a crutch. The Bible said whatever excuse he had, he got rid of it. It requires devotion. You will only do what you want to do. You'll only do what you're devoted to. Peter said, I'll forsake it all. And then thirdly, look what he says. Not only does it require decision, and it requires devotion, but look what he says in verse number 11 again. And what followed him? It requires determination. It requires determination. He followed the Lord. Every one of us, at, at times in our life, want to lead. And you say, well, Pastor Brian, what do you mean by that? We want to lead by letting God know where we're going. But God said, if you can't follow me, you can't be my disciple. 
Everybody wants to be the leader. You say, that's not true. How many remember your elementary school? And the teacher said, line up. Where did everybody run? To the front of the line. I'm going to be leader. I'm going to be the line leader. You didn't want to be the second guy in line because he was the door holder. You want to be the line leader. Every one of us want to lead. And we, that happens in our spiritual life, don't, don't, doesn't it? We stop asking God what we want. We stop telling God what we want. We stop asking God what His desire is. And we start telling God what we believe He should do for us. And the Bible says that He forsook all, but then He followed Him. If you're going to follow the Lord, you're going to have to be determined to follow Him. Amen. How often has it happened in our life? And I'm just about done. All right, some of, you, some of you moms wake up. I'm coming back there, okay? How often does it happen in our life? Lord, I'm going to get this thing right. I've heard it over and over again. I'll tell you what, Pastor Ryan, I'm going to be in church. I made my mind. I'll be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm going to be here. And you know what the first Sunday morning? The devil says, well, wait a minute. you got all this stuff to do. And you go, well, I guess I can't do that for God. That's not determination. Well, we're going to have a missions conference. I'll tell you what, I'm so tired. Can I tell you, I don't know many people today who aren't tired at the end of the day. Amen. Come home. Every one of us are flesh. You sit down and something happens when you sit down. Your eyelids close. I went to the doctor the other day. I hope, my doc, hope our doctor don't watch live stream. I went to the doctor the other day and he said to me, he was asking me some questions. I said, man, I just feel tired all the time. I just feel tired all the time. And you know what he said to me? He said, well, you know, you're over 40 now. <laughs> I said, sir. And I started crying. <laughs> Hurt my feelings. I don't know anybody that's not tired. But if you're going to follow God, it takes some determination. It takes just you saying, hey, in spite of being tired, in spite of being busy, in spite of being spent, God, what you desire means so much more than any of that. Do you know our, our jobs, our possessions, they're a means to an end. They're a means to an end. That's all they are. God has blessed you with all that for one reason, to honor Him. That's it. Because when it's over, we're not taking any of it with us. Somebody else will spend the money that you have in your bank account now. Somebody else will live in the house that you live in. Somebody else will drive the car that you drive. Somebody else will fill the position that you have. It's just a means to an end, and yet we're more devoted to that than we are God's plan. What did Peter do? He said, no, Lord. He said, I've, I've forsaken it all. He said, and I'm following you. Here's what he said. I'm not going back. Lord, I'm leaving it all. Your will is more important in my life. Well, say, Pastor Brian, I remember when Peter said, I go a fishing. Remember when he said that? Later on in the, the New Testament, Peter said, I'm going fishing. God got hold of his life again. Take him over to the book of Acts. And he stood at Pentecost. A man that, the man that caught fish for a living stood at Pentecost. And the, the greatest revival in history began. It started with a man who recognized that what God wanted for his life was so much more than what you and I need. Amen. So much more than what's important to us. What God wants more important. Do your kids know that about you, Daddy? Mama, do your children know that about you? Remember I said at the beginning of the service, we reap a harvest where we place an emphasis and when we emphasize spiritual matters and we emphasize spiritual thinking, we're, we'll develop spiritual thinking. Do our kids know that about us? Do they know that God is first? He forsook all to follow Him. There has to be a leaving. So you need to leave some things behind tonight. I don't doubt for one moment that God is speaking to our hearts in some way. Amen. I don't doubt it for one moment. 
But the decision, the decision has to be made. What, did, what was Peter's decision when he recognized who God was? He was willing to do what God wanted. What we need done in our life, pay attention to me, girls. What we need done in our life, only God can do. Amen. We forsook all and followed him. Let's pray together, maybe. Lord, we love you. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house this evening. And Lord, I know that...